This Week in Defense News with Vago Maradian. Good morning, happy Memorial Day weekend, and welcome to the show. This week, the U.S. Army revamped its biggest program, the Future Combat Systems. Was that a good idea? We'll hear from two experts later in the show. But first, we're looking to the skies. When Defense Secretary Robert Gates capped production of the Air Force's F-22 fighter last month, he accelerated production of another new jet, the F-35 Lightning II, which has long been known as the Joint Strike Fighter. The Pentagon plans to buy 30 of these stealthy supersonic jets from Lockheed Martin in 2010, spending $10.4 billion. Those planes will be shared among the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, and will pave the way for testing and development of a jet with electronics so powerful, analysts say will bring an unprecedented combination of sensor and strike capabilities to support future ground troops. And not a moment too soon. Each of the services faces its own fighter gap as older jets retire. But the Government Accountability Office warns that buying large numbers of aircraft before all testing is completed is a recipe for disaster. What's the status of the $300 billion program that is the world's largest multinational defense effort? Joining me now is Brigadier General David Hines, the Program Executive Officer for the F-35 program. General, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's start out. The plane was supposed to be a very, very economical replacement for F-16s, F-18s, uh, Harriers, A-10s. What's the unit cost of the F-35 now? Let me talk in the way we speak to it very specifically, which is in base year O2 dollars so that we avoid all the inflation. Today, the price of that aircraft for the CTOL variant is roughly $50 million. Which is the Air Force. The Air Force variant will be a $50 million That's dollar correct. airplane. That's correct. What about the Navy variants and the Marine Corps they, versions? They are both higher than that by about $15 million. And much of that is predicated on the ramp that we end up buying in the end. So, so it depends on the total number of aircraft that are going to be in the buy. As well as what years you buy them in, because the faster you buy them, the faster you get down the learning curve. Now, of that price increase, it used to be $37 million for CTOL in 2001. 92% of that cost growth has essentially been out of the hands of the program. When I changed the ramp to extend it by seven years and reduce the buy, that obviously had a very large impact on the cost of the program. And I think in 2001, no one could have predicted what happened in the metal markets, which in some cases are 500% over what they were in Copper, that time frame. titanium, exactly. et cetera, all materials. Nickel materials and then labor rates, which have been much higher relative to what was predicted in 2001. In part because of, of, of rising health care costs. Um, how many aircraft are supposed to be in the buy right now? For total, For the, the, U total. the U.S. is looking at 2,443. And then the international market, A little project? over 700. So we believe 3,100 aircraft today with another potential to 1,000 to 2,000, or perhaps even higher in the FMS market. In the, in the foreign military sales market. What was the impact of Secretary Gates' decision to accelerate the program? Well, the acceleration, 28 aircraft in the fit-up raised me from 485 aircraft to 513 in that five-year span. So it was really only an increase of 5.5% over what was budgeted last year. The real point of that was the vote of confidence that the partners saw in terms of the administration support for this aircraft. So as that decision went forward, we saw other nations start to also show their support to the program. UK has purchased its test aircraft this year. The Netherlands has agreed to purchase its test aircraft this year. We saw a vote of confidence from Norway and Australia relative to their white paper, all indicating that JSF was the airplane of choice. Which, which was the fear that some of these nations would back out and then the unit prices for everybody would, would, would go up. Precisely. Um, the GAO in March criticized the, basically the strategy on the program to do the concurrent development, testing, and, and, and procurement. Um, and they say that that's led to pro cost overruns and scheduled delays. How do you respond to that? My response is, is that concurrency was known when we started the program. It was actually a basis of it. There is very good value for concurrency, and that is that it starts you with a production mindset, which we've had. The very first test airplane and all subsequent have come off of a production line. They're not hand-built aircraft, and what that means is we've not only got the design right, but we're now maturing the manufacturing process and the supplier base to be able to make this a producible airplane at one a day. That's the rate we're going to go to. That very good learning curve allows you to get the cost of the airplane down much faster than traditional programs. So even today, the rate that I am building that airplane, I will save the U.S. taxpayers $12 billion over a basic rate that you had done that was recommended by the GAO. Now, even if the cost to retrofit was twice as high as an F-22, which only would cost me $2 billion to retrofit to the airplanes I build in that rate, the taxpayer saves $10 billion. Let me take you to the F-22. You mentioned sure. that. For, for very many years, uh, officials would always say that these two programs, the F-22 and the F-35, are, are interlinked and that 
changing the F-22 rate would damage the F-35 program. The F-22 is going to be terminated at 187 airplanes unless Congress really objects to it. How does that affect your program? Well, we have to look very closely at the industrial base issues. Certainly that there are some of the decisions for rate structure, for instance, Pratt & Whitney, Lockheed Martin was based on those aircraft being present in the build. So those industries are going to have to look very closely at their capitalization structures and make corrections as quickly as possible so that I don't pay overhead rates because F-22 has gone away. I'm most concerned about the engine side of this because a lot of the F-119 production flows directly into 135. So right, the, the same core of the engine. Correct. Is, is that very engineering much the same. staff, the facilities that were built around that. So. So it's so you're not absolutely certain whether or not there there may be a negative cost impact for your program because of this. Correct. There may be from the standpoint that now I have a larger facility that is not being fully utilized because of the F-22 portion of that. However, I believe my rates can come up fast enough to fill in those holes very quickly. And in the meantime, I'm trusting the contractors to make very smart business decisions in the short term to avoid those high cost increases. Let me ask you a little bit about the concept of operations for this, for this new jet. It brings unprecedented sensor capability and strike capability. Have the ground forces, the Army and the Marine Corps, done enough to be able to take maximum advantage of this airplane when it comes online? I mean, don't people need to be buying ground stations and start to change their concepts of operation we, we accordingly? We very much need to continue down that line, but I think uh, within the current air domain, we're doing a very good job. Streaming video will be a requirement in the future. The, be able to, the ability to pass pictures and other tactical information to a ground one will be a requirement in the future. I don't have those capabilities within the airplane now, but the, we are looking at it for the JSF program in the next block upgrade and will be compatible, I believe, with rover ground stations and other stations that exist today within that. So you're doing that already in the current scope of the program? We're, we're trying very hard in the next upgrade past the initial delivery of the aircraft to start incorporating those very same elements for the ground commanders. It is all about that interoperability across all three domains the maritime domain, the ground domain, and then the air and space domain. We're doing very well in air and space. We need to continue along the other two domains. Thanks very much, General Hines. The F-35 Lightning program is one of the biggest international efforts. Are its foreign partners going to be remaining aboard? Stay tuned.